Let's return to the Gospel of John. We're in chapter 10, and our passage here, the greater passage, is at the Feast of Dedication, Messianic Claims and Real Opposition. That's 10, 22 to 39. And here, this interaction between the Lord Jesus and the crowd is the last one in the Gospel of John, last public interaction like this. In this conversation, the themes that have been brought up and developed, like sheep and shepherd's voice and faith because of miracles, eternal life, the Lord's relationship with his Father, they're presented with more clarity. The people, therefore, have to make their decision about him. After this conversation, there'll be one other miracle, the resurrection of Lazarus, to convince them that Jesus is the Messiah who has a unique relationship with God the Father, sent from God the Father. After that miracle, the Lord Jesus will stop interacting with the crowds in the Gospel of John. Now, in this recording, we're going to look at 10, 22 through 30, and the title can be, Jesus is the Messiah. So, in 7, 10 through 53, they were celebrating the Feast of Booths. Chapter 8 takes place at the end of the Feast of Booths. Between the Feast of Booths and the Feast of the Dedication of the Temple, there's a three-month gap. In 10, 22 through 39, the Feast of the Dedication of the Temple is celebrated. And here in our passage, 10, 22 through 30, the Lord does summarize some things that he's already said. His works should be a sufficient testimony, but those that oppose him are not of his chosen sheep, so they will not believe. Those that do believe, they have eternal life. And our passage ends with the amazing words, I and the Father are one. Chapter 10, verse 22. Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. The Greek name for this Jewish feast is Egkynia, and it means renewals. The name Feast of Dedication reflects the Hebrew name of the feast, Chanukah, meaning dedication. It's celebrated on the 25th of the month of Chislev, which for us is falls in November or December. This Feast of Dedication is not an Old Testament feast. Well after the Old Testament canon was closed, in the year 167 B.C., Antiochus Epiphanes defeated Jerusalem and defiled the temple. In 165 BC, the Jews set Jerusalem free and dedicated the temple in an eight-day ceremony. Since that day, the Feast of Dedication has been celebrated every year. This background is described in 1 Maccabees 4.36-59 4.36-59 and 2 Maccabees 1.9, 1, 1.18 and 10.1-8. Now Maccabees, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, we Protestants don't recognize these books as a part of the biblical canon, but if you want to read these valuable historical documents, not inspired by God, but still ancient documents about life in Israel, They are easily available in any Catholic Bible. And in the Catholic Bible, they're called deuterocanonical. Well, every Jew knows that the Feast of Dedication takes place in winter. But this is another example of John's helpful explanation for non-Jewish readers. Chapter 10, verse 23. And Jesus was walking in the temple complex in the colonnade of Solomon. Our translation here, the temple complex, reflects the word Heeran. This is, again, the building of the building, the temple building, and the surrounding courtyards. This is the word Heeran, frequent in the Gospel of John. The colonnade, a colonnade, you can also translate portico, or sometimes some people say porch. Solomon's colonnade was a long structure consisting of a roof supported by pillars along the southern part of the eastern wall of the temple complex. And it was 
open on the side facing the temple. So it was winter, and it's very understandable that they weren't out in the open in the courtyard, but they were under this colonnade. It can be, it can snow sometimes in Jerusalem, not every year, but it can snow in Jerusalem, and it can be cold and rainy in the, in the uh, winter months. So John makes a note here that it was winter, and they were under this colonnade. Chapter 10, verse 24. So the Jews surrounded him, and they were saying, How long will you hold us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. These words, how long will you hold us in suspense, try to capture the literal words, which literally you might translate it, until when do you lift up our soul? <laughs> how long do you hold us in suspense? That's a good translation, I think. The Jewish leaders opposing the Lord Jesus surrounded him. Perhaps this was in an effort to force him to respond to them in a way that they could use against him. And they were saying that the problem was his lack of clarity. Hmm. If you're the Messiah, if you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Well, in fact, to the woman at Jacob's well, he did clearly indicate that he was the Messiah. But he doesn't say that before a Jewish audience. Remember the woman at the well, this was Samaria. That, that was Samaria, quite different. He didn't say that in front of a Jewish audience. For them, the term Messiah, the term Christ, it had military implications. They were sure that when the Christ would come, his first action would be, of course, to overthrow the evil Roman Empire. And he doesn't want to be misunderstood. Chapter 10, verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works which I am doing in the name of my Father, these testify concerning me. He disagreed with them concerning the nature of the problem. They say he's not being clear. He says he's being clear. He never told them openly he was the Messiah. Such words would be misunderstood. And compare the situation in 615. He did not want them to come to take him by force to make him king. Therefore, he didn't declare himself to be the Messiah in clear words to Jews. But if they're willing to pay attention to it, he has told them through miracles, figures of speech, and teachings. Chapter 10, verse 26. But you do not believe, for you are not of my sheep, just as I said to you. They rejected him. They did not believe. Why? Because they were not of his sheep. This means not chosen, not given to him by his father. He said similar things in the past. Note John 6, 44, no one is able to come to me except the father draws him. So somehow here, perhaps beyond the reach of the theologian's insight, that truth stands right beside another truth in the Gospel of John. People are urged to believe in him. And yet, if they're not of his sheep, they won't come to him. If they're not chosen, they won't come to him. And yet, they're told to believe. These things sit side by side in the Gospel of John. People are urged to believe. Those that reject him can't believe because they're not chosen. Very soon, apparently to the same group of people, the Lord will say, but if I do them, these works, and you do not believe in me, believe in the works, so that you might know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. That's chapter 10, verse 38. They do not believe again, because they're not of his sheep, and yet the Lord urges them to believe. Their situation as people who are not of his sheep does not release them from their liability for judgment. The Lord understood that only those chosen could hear his voice and follow him. Their lack of faith was because they weren't of the elect. Hopefully, that's the only reason for any lack of success in our evangelism. However, there can be other reasons, such as the poor testimony of the evangelist, or inappropriate gospel presentation, or poor history with Christians who did not give a good testimony before those unbelievers. Chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, 
and I know them, and they follow me. We may think he should have said, and they know me, but he said, and I know them. What's important here is that he knows them, because he knows them, his sheep obey him. Chapter 10, verse 28, And I give them eternal life, and they shall certainly not perish, and no one snatches them from my hand. The, the word snatches here, this word harpazo, it's used 13 times in the New Testament. It frequently suggests a violent snatching, as in Matthew 13, 19. John 6, 15. John 10, 12. Acts 23.10, and finally Jude 23. Even if someone wants to take us away violently, they will fail. In verses 26 and 27, he has said that his sheep believe in him. In verse 10, we read that his sheep have life and that they have it abundantly. This verse explains that that life is eternal life. They receive eternal life, and they certainly will not perish. This promise is almost the same as John 3.16, but in this verse, the promise is strengthened by the expression of the protection of his sheep. No one will snatch them from his hand. The sheep are safe, not because they hold on to his hand tightly, but because they are held on to tightly. No thief or wolf, or bear, can snatch them from the hand of the Lord Jesus. Chapter 10, verse 29. It is my Father who has given them to me. He's greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them from my Father's hand. Well, this verse confirms the working relationship between the Father and the Son, a relationship described in some detail in chapter 6, verses 37 to 40. The unity between the Son and the Father, the greatness of God the Father, those are proofs that the Lord Jesus will not fail to protect his sheep. This verse suggests that only someone greater than God the Father would be able to snatch believers from his Father's hand. There's no one greater than God the Father. We believers are safe. We will not perish. Believers will not perish. So verses 28 and 29 are powerful statements about what theologians call eternal security. How could we lose our salvation if such care is given in this matter by both the Lord Jesus and his Father? I know that some people explain this by saying that, oh, our salvation cannot be taken away from us, but we can give it away. But that's not reasonable in the face of these two verses. Imagine that someone would want to take himself out of the Father's hand. Imagine that someone would want to rid himself of eternal life, as some people suggest. Why would anyone do that? Only because they were driven to such a terrible act by demonic or human pressure. But in effect, then that demonic or human pressure would be what takes that person out of his Father's hand. And again, Nothing, no one, can take them out of my Father's hand. No, no one is able to snatch any believer from his Father's hand, not even that believer himself. Again, these verses are powerful restatements of the doctrine of eternal security. Chapter 10, verse 30. I and the Father are one. The term hen here is the word one in the singular neuter form in Greek. Now, according to Augustine, even, the grammar of this sentence with the singular and plural forms is proof of the triune God. The Lord did not use the word haste in the masculine because with this word, the sentence would mean that the Son and the Father are the same. And we know that the Son and the Father are not the same. Just go back to chapter 1, verse 1, you might say 1, verse 1b. 
the Son and the Father are not the same person. The hand of the Lord Jesus and the hand of God the Father do the same work, which is to protect his sheep. They have a unity of, in purpose and work, a unique unity. As Carson notes, according to 1722, believers can have a similar unity. But in the context of the Gospel of John, for example, chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 18, and chapter 20, verse 28, the unity of the Son and the Father, it, it's more fundamental than the unity of believers. The Lord Jesus did not merely say that he and God the Father have a unity in terms of purpose. He said that they have a unity in nature. And the response of the Jews in the following verse supports that understanding. Well, to summarize chapter 10, verses 22 through 30 here, in this portion of the Lord's last recorded interaction with those that oppose him, and this took place during the Feast of Dedication, the Lord summarizes some things that he's already said. His works are sufficient testimony to the validity of his claims, but they, not being among his chosen sheep, do not believe. Those that do believe have eternal life, which cannot be taken away from them. And finally, the Lord states that he and the Father are one.